fair weather favored the Armada de Molucca, and gusts carried the ship southwest to the Canary Islands, off the coast of the Western Sahara. For centuries, this group of seven volcanic islands had served as a stopover for ships bound to and from the Iberian Peninsula. During those brief days in the Canaries, Magellan busied himself with the final provisioning of his fleet. He worked quickly, too quickly, as he would later discover to his horror. For the merchants of the Canaries, practiced in deception, swindled Magellan by falsifying their bills of lading. They vastly overstated the amount of supplies they sold to the fleet, and what they did sell was in poor condition. This type of cheating was common and very dangerous to the expeditions whose lives depended on the food acquired in the Canaries. After three busy days in one of Tenerife's harbors, Pigafetta wrote, We departed thence and came to a port called Montrose, where we remained two days to furnish ourselves with pitch, which is a thing very necessary for ships. While there, Magellan heard disturbing news. The king of Portugal had dispatched not one, but two fleets of caravels to arrest him. Magellan also received a secret communique from his father-in-law, Diogo Barbosa, warning that the Castilian captains in the Armada de Molucca planned to mutiny at the very first chance. They might even kill Magellan to attain their goal. Keep a good watch, Barbosa admonished. The ringleader's name came as no surprise to Magellan, Juan de Cartagena, the Castilian with blood ties to Bishop Fonseca. Magellan's concern about the safety of his fleet and his own life could only have increased as he contemplated the Portuguese ships in hot pursuit. Unwilling to give his rebellious captains further cause for alarm, he kept both warnings to himself. Under the circumstances, Magellan decided that the best course of action was to leave the Canaries immediately. Poorly provisioned, but afraid for his life and the welfare of the fleet, Magellan gave the order to raise anchor and set sail at midnight, October 3rd. Magellan ordered the fleet to take evasive action by following an unexpected course. He led the fleet southwest, hugging the coast of Africa, rather than west across the Atlantic. From the deck of San Antonio, Following closely behind the flagship, Cartagena immediately challenged Magellan's orders. Why, he demanded, was Magellan following this unusual route? Follow and do not ask questions, instructed the captain general. Cartagena continued to protest, insisting that Magellan should have consulted his captains and his pilots. Was he trying to get them all killed by following this dangerous course? Magellan did not attempt to explain. He simply reminded the other captains to follow, and that they did. The mutiny that he expected to break out at any moment failed to materialize, and order reigned aboard the ships, at least for the time being. For the next fifteen days, the Armada de Molucca ran before the wind. The favorable conditions placated the irritable captains and gave Magellan time to strategize about the best way to avoid his Portuguese pursuers. But as they worked their way farther south, the weather turned foul. They had no reliable nautical charts, no idea when their miserable weather would change. Cooking fires were extinguished, the men went without sleep, and life on board the battered vessels became exceedingly precarious. The changeable winds blew the ships sideways into the troughs between waves. As the ships were tossed about, their yard arms dipped into the seething water, a prelude to a possible shipwreck. To keep from being dragged under, the captains on several occasions came close to ordering their men to chop down the masts, a desperate measure that would have disabled the fleet once the weather began to clear. Instead, they cleared nearly all their sail, offering bare masts to the relentless wind. Pigafetta wrote, Thus we sailed for sixty days of rain to the equinoctial line. Throughout the ordeal, sharks constantly circled the ships, terrifying the crew. After weeks of constant, life-threatening storms, several hissing, incandescent globes mysteriously appeared on the yardarms of Magellan's ship, Trinidad. St. Elmo's fire! Here was a natural phenomenon to rival any fanciful supernatural apparition catalogued by Pliny or Sir John Mandeville. St. Elmo's fire is a dramatic electrical discharge that looks like a stream of fire as it trails from the mast of a ship. It can even play about someone's head, 
causing an eerie, tingling sensation. The superstitious sailors, always alert to omens, associated the phenomenon with St. Peter Gonzalez, a Dominican priest who was considered the patron saint of mariners and who had acquired the name St. Elmo. The fire was regarded as a sign of his protection. Once the apparition subsided, some crew members believed that supernatural powers had singled out the Captain General for a special destiny. But their deliverance from the perils of the sea proved brief, and their faith in Magellan's ability to save them would soon be tested again. Sixty days of furious storms left the ships of the Armada de Malacca in need of repair and ruined a good part of the precious food supply. Magellan found it necessary to reduce rations. Each man received only four pints of drinking water a day and half that amount of wine. Hardtack, the staple of the sailor's diet, was also reduced to a pound and a half a day. As with his other decisions, Magellan did not explain why he was reducing the amount of food and drink, and no other decision he could take was as likely to cause resentment among the captains and the crew. Once the gales abated, the battered ships drifted into the equatorial calms. As the sails luffed lamely amid rising temperatures, the ships rode helplessly in the water. The rebellious Spanish captains, with time on their hands, resumed plotting against the captain general, displaying a pointed lack of regard for the status of a man they considered their social inferior. Magellan inadvertently set the stage for their mutiny when he reminded his officers that the instructions he had received from King Charles gave him full authority over the fleet. The captain of each ship was to approach Trinidad at dusk to pay his respects to Magellan and to receive orders. Cartagena chose to defy Magellan in a studied manner. When San Antonio approached the flagship, the quartermaster, rather than Cartagena, spoke up, and worse, he refused to address Magellan by the correct title. The lowly quartermaster called Magellan Captain rather than Captain General. Magellan sharply reminded Cartagena of the proper form of address, but the Castilian captain took the opportunity to insult Magellan again. If he did not approve of San Antonio's quartermaster offering the ceremonial salute, Cartagena would select a lowly page next time. For several days after that exchange, Cartagena neglected all forms of salute. Magellan had to devise an effective way to handle Cartagena's defiant attitude or risk losing control over the entire fleet. At this tense moment, a new crisis erupted aboard Victoria. Magellan learned that Victoria's master, a Sicilian named Antonio Salomon, had been discovered sodomizing a cabin boy, Antonio Genovese. The two had been caught in flagrante delicto. Under Spanish law, homosexuality was punishable by death. As captain general of the fleet, Magellan had to take disciplinary action. But he found himself in an impossible predicament, caught between the cruelty of Spanish law and the reality of homosexuality at sea. In practice, homosexuality among sailors confined to ships over long periods of time was inevitable. There are few accounts of captains attempting to punish sailors for this behavior. Instead, they simply look the other way. Magellan took a harsher course of action. He held a court-martial, and Salomon was condemned to death by strangulation. The deed was to be carried out several weeks hence, on December 20th. After the hearing, Magellan held a tense meeting with the other captains of the fleet in his cabin. There was Cartagena from San Antonio, Quesada from Concepcion, Mendoza from Victoria, and Serrano from Santiago. As Magellan realized, all the captains, except for Serrano, were determined to lead a mutiny. Cartagena immediately began attacking Magellan about the eccentric and dangerous course they had been following along the coast of Africa. Cartagena insisted that the only explanation for this bizarre behavior was that Magellan intended to subvert the fleet because Magellan's true loyalty belonged with the King of Portugal. In fact, the Captain General had chosen the risky, unorthodox course to avoid the Portuguese caravels pursuing him and was actually doing his best to frustrate Spain's enemies. Another resentment fueled Cartagena's passion for mutiny. He believed that King Charles had appointed the two of them as co-admirals of the fleet. As a Castilian loyal to his sovereign, 
Cartagena declared that he would no longer take orders from Magellan. Fully prepared to counter Cartagena's challenge, the Captain General gave a sign and Trinidad's Aguacil, or Master at Arms, Gonzalo Gomez de Espinosa, stormed the cabin. Right behind him came two loyalists, Duarte Barbosa and Magellan's illegitimate son, Cristoval Ribello, all with swords drawn. Magellan leaped at Cartagena, catching the Castilian by the ruff of his shirt, and shoved him into a chair. Rebel, Magellan shouted. This is mutiny. You are my prisoner in the king's name. At that, Cartagena barked at the other traitorous captains, Casada and Mendoza, to stab Magellan with their daggers. From the way he spoke, it was apparent that the three of them had plotted to overthrow the captain general, but now, at the crucial moment, lost their resolve to act. Seizing the initiative, Espinosa, in his role as Aguacil, picked up Cartagena and shoved him out the captain's cabin to the main deck, where he was secured to stocks intended for common seamen who had committed minor offenses. Casada and Mendoza pleaded with Magellan to free Cartagena, or failing that, to release him into their custody. They persuaded Magellan that he had nothing to fear from them, and he agreed to free Cartagena on condition that Mendoza confine him aboard Victoria. Cartagena was immediately relieved of command. Had he chosen, Magellan could have convened a court-martial and sentenced Cartagena to death. As Captain General, he would have been within his rights because Cartagena had plotted to kill Magellan. Nothing could be more serious. But Magellan was acutely aware of Cartagena's privileged position and concerned that executing or severely punishing him would be inflammatory. So for once, he erred on the side of caution. The lack of disciplinary action made it a certainty that the irascible Castilian would continue to challenge Magellan until only one of them remained. With the brief mutiny at an end, Magellan ordered the trumpets aboard the flagship to sound, alerting the other ships, and he announced that henceforth San Antonio would be commanded by Antonio de Coca. Stripped of his command, and having learned nothing from the experience of his failed mutiny, Cartagena grew intensely resentful of his inexperienced replacement. From that moment, he burned with a desire for revenge against Magellan. With Cartagena removed from power, at least temporarily, Magellan turned his attention to his long-delayed crossing of the Atlantic. Magellan ordered the ships to set a southwesterly course toward Rio de Janeiro. Learning that Concepcion's pilot, Joao López Carvalho, had visited Rio several years before on an earlier expedition, Magellan brought him over to Trinidad to serve as pilot. At about the same time, Francisco Albo began keeping a navigational log intended for use by those following in the wake of the Armada de Molucca. Neither of these expert pilots knew of the South Equatorial Current, which carried the fleet west of its intended heading. Rather than Rio de Janeiro, the fleet raised Cape St. Augustine, some Brazil distance north of their intended the destination, on November 29th. Magellan was likely to Here, Pigafetta relates, the, the fleet paused to take on fresh food and Vespucci water reported, and quickly resumed this following land the Brazilian is very delightful coast and, and covered Rio de Janeiro an infinite number of as the green best trees navigational mines and very big ones which ships, never lose their foliage why they and through the year course. yield the sweetest aromatic perfumes Finally, and produce later, an infinite variety of fruit, 13, gratifying to the taste and the healthful to the body. And, and the fields produce herbs and flowers and, and many sweet and good roots, which are so marvelous that I fancied myself to be near the terrestrial paradise. At the time of Magellan's arrival, there may have been as many as 400,000 Guarani Indians grouped by dialects. They occupied huge regions of South America, extending all the way to the Andes, and lived communally in huts sheltering about a dozen families each. Polygamy was not unknown to them, but it was not common. They were short, rarely more than five feet tall, and by European standards, stout. The men wore a simple g-string and occasionally a headpiece made of feathers. The women were fully clothed. They were adept at pottery, wood carving, and skillful in their weapons of choice, the bow and arrow and the blowgun. The arrival of the Armada de Molucca in Rio de Janeiro coincided with heavy rains that ended a two-month drought in the region. Pigafetta wrote, 
The day we arrived, the rain began, so that the people of the place said that we came from heaven and had brought the rain with us. The sight of the strange ships arriving in the harbor inspired benign rather than warlike feelings in the hearts of the Indians, as Pigafetta would learn. Yet the Guarani Indians disturbed Pigafetta. He had no doubt that the Indians practiced cannibalism and provided a gruesome description of how it had become part of their everyday life. They do not eat the bodies all at once, but everyone cuts off a piece and carries it to his house where he smokes it. Then, every week, he cuts off a small bit which he eats thus smoked with his other food to remind him of his enemies. As Magellan's ships came to rest, a throng of women, all of them naked and eager for contact with the sojourners, swam out to greet them. Deprived of the company of women for months, the sailors believed that they had found an earthly paradise. Any fear they might have had of Indian cannibals melted in the flame of carnal pleasure. Discovering that the women were for sale, the sailors gladly exchanged their cheap German knives for sexual favors. Night after night on the beach, the sailors and the Indian women drank, danced, and exchanged partners in moonlit orgies. But there were limits, said Pigafetta. The men gave us one or two of their young daughters as slaves for one hatchet, or one large knife, but they would not give us their wives in exchange for anything at all. Under the strain of temptation, one of Magellan's most trusted allies, Duarte Barbosa, who had offered critical assistance when Cartagena mutinied, all but lost his head in Rio de Janeiro. Falling under the women's spell and envisioning a life of ease as a traitor on these distant shores, he decided to desert the fleet. Magellan learned of the plan and intervened at the last minute, sending sailors to arrest Barbosa on shore and drag him back to the ships. The poor man spent the rest of the layover in Rio de Janeiro, confined in fetters aboard his ship, gazing on the women and the self-indulgent life that Magellan and duty denied him. While the sailors pursued their casual liaisons with the Indian women, Magellan transacted business with their men. He took on fresh supplies of water and provisions, trading insignificant trinkets, such as the tiny bells that he had brought with him from Seville, for precious food. Wrote Pigafetta, The people of this place gave for a knife or fish hook five or six fowls, and for a comb a brace of geese. For a small mirror or a pair of scissors, they gave us as many fish as ten men could have eaten. For a bell or a leather lace, they gave us a basket full of fruit. The captain general and the fleet's three priests intended to maintain strict religious observance throughout the voyage, both to keep their own sailors faithful and to impress the local inhabitants with the power of Christianity. And the impressionable Indians eagerly accepted Magellan's invitation to attend worship. Pigafetta wrote, Mass was said twice on shore, during which those people remained on their knees with so great contrition and with clasped hands raised aloft that it was an exceedingly great pleasure to behold them. The tranquility of the fleet's layover in Rio de Janeiro was interrupted by a traumatic event, carrying out Antonio Salomon's death sentence on December 20th. On the appointed day, Magellan summoned the officers and crew of Trinidad to watch the execution of the man who had committed a crime against nature. One of the sailors, never named, his face likely hooded to preserve his anonymity, strangled Salomon in full view of the other men as a warning. The grisly spectacle, performed with military efficiency, increased resentment among the crew against the captain general. There are conflicting accounts concerning Antonio Ginoves, the cabin boy whose life Magellan had spared. In one version, Ginoves suffered such extreme ridicule from other crew members that he threw himself overboard and was lost. And in another, the cabin boy, an object of scorn, was thrown overboard to his death. No matter which version was correct, the double tragedy marked the only time Magellan addressed the subject of homosexuality throughout the voyage. Five days later, the Armada de Molucca observed its first Christmas away from Spain in the shelter of Rio's harbor. 
but there was little time to reflect on the holiday because the men busily prepared the ships for departure. Just before sailing, Magellan replaced Antonio de Coca, the fleet accountant who had briefly assumed command of San Antonio from Cartagena, with the inexperienced Alvaro de Mesquita. Both de Coca and Cartagena took the shuffle as an insult because Mesquita had shipped out aboard the flagship from Seville as a mere supernumerary. The deposed captains cried nepotism, which was true, because Mesquita was Magellan's cousin. After two weeks of central indulgence, the fleet's departure from Rio de Janeiro on December 27th became an emotionally charged affair. João López Cavallo, Magellan's pilot, returning to Brazil after a seven-year absence, happily reunited with his former mistress, who introduced him to their son. Carvalho took an immediate liking to the lad, whom he called João Zito, and enlisted him as a servant aboard ship. As the fleet prepared to embark, the pilot beseeched Magellan for permission to take along the mother of his child, but Magellan allowed absolutely no women on the ships. Carvalho would sail alone. Alarmed by the prospect of other liaisons affecting the crew, Magellan ordered an inspection of every inch of each ship for female stowaways. Several were found and swiftly returned to shore. When the fleet finally weighed anchor and sailed away, Indian women followed them in canoes, tearfully pleading with the men from distant shores to stay with them forever. Resuming a southerly course, the fleet reached Paranagua Bay, off the coast of Brazil, by the last day of 1519. On January 10th, the rolling hills and mountains of the South American coast yielded to barely discernible hummocks and the suggestion of offshore islands. Carvalho declared that they had arrived at Cape Santa Maria. It was now summer in these sub-equatorial regions, and Magellan wanted to take advantage of the relatively mild weather and traverse the strait before it turned cold. Magellan's hope for a swift completion to the expedition would not be fulfilled. At sea, sleep became the ultimate luxury, a solace nearly impossible to come by. The crew took naps whenever they could, night or day. Hammocks had yet to be introduced on board ships, so exhausted sailors appropriated a plank, or better still, a sheltered area of the deck where they could sprawl. They eased the wood's bruising hardness with a straw pallet and shielded themselves against the cold and wet with heavy blankets. Even then, comfort eluded them. The men never became accustomed to the foul odors brewing aboard their ships. Water seeping into the hold stank, despite the efforts to disinfect it with vinegar. Animals such as cows and pigs added to the reek, as did the slowly rotting food supply and the sickening smell of salted fish wafting from the hold. Pests were ubiquitous, an inescapable fact of life at sea. Pterodos, or shipworms, bored through the hull. Rats and mice infested every ship. And the men of the Armada de Molucca were plagued with all manner of lice, bedbugs, and cockroaches. Even worse, weevils invaded the hardtack, and it was further contaminated with the urine and feces of rodents. Crew members with growling stomachs forced themselves to overcome their inhibitions and swallow this disgusting, contaminated provender. Magellan's crew was overwhelmingly Castilian and Portuguese, but representatives of every major country in Western Europe, as well as North Africa, Greece, Rhodes, and Sicily filled the ranks. Their number included alliances of natural enemies, Britons and Basques, Flemish and French, all speaking in mutually unintelligible tongues. The common language aboard Magellan's fleet was nautical Castilian, which contained specialized terms for every line, clue, and device to be found aboard the ships. The men quickly left behind the identities they had maintained on land for those imposed on them at sea. No longer did it matter if they were Castilians, Greeks, Portuguese, or Genoese. Life aboard ship was lived according to a rigid social structure segregating men who nonetheless lived in extremely close quarters and who depended on each other for their survival. A strict division of labor ruled over all. At the bottom were the pages, assigned to the ships in pairs. Many pages were mere children as young as eight. 
None was older than 15. They were commonly orphans. Not all pages were created equal. Some had been virtually kidnapped from the Keys of Seville and pressed into service. If they had not been on ships, they would have been roaming the streets, learning to pick pockets and getting into minor scrapes. They were treated harshly, exploited shamelessly, deprived of adequate pay, and occasionally made the victims of sexual predators among older crew members. Their chores included scrubbing the decks with salt water hauled from the sea in buckets, serving and cleaning after meals, and performing any menial task assigned to them. Another class of page lived a very different life, privileged and relatively free of demand under the protection of officers. These hand-picked young men generally came from good, well-connected families and worked as apprentices for their protectors. They were expected to learn their trade and to rise through the ranks. Their duties were far lighter than those of the unfortunate boys who had been pressed into service. The privileged pages maintained the 16 Venetian sand clocks, or ampoletas, carried by Magellan ships. Basically a large hourglass, the sand clock had been in use since Egyptian times. It was essential for both timekeeping and for navigation. The ampoletas consisted of a glass vessel divided into two compartments. The upper chamber contained a quantity of sand trickling into the lower over a precisely measured period of time, usually a half hour or an hour. Maintaining the ampoletas was simple enough. The pages turned them over every half hour, night and day. But the task was critical. Aboard a swaying ship, the ampoletas were the only reliable timepiece, and the captain depended on them for dead reckoning and for changing the watches. A ship without a functioning ampoletta was effectively disabled. Just above the pages in rank came the apprentices, the most expendable and vulnerable members of all the crew. Ranging in age from 17 to 20, they were the ones who sprang on the rigging the moment the captain ordered them to furl or unfurl the sail or to scamper to the dangerous lookout posts atop the masts. They pulled on the oars in the longboats and operated the complex mechanical devices aboard ship, the pulleys and cranes, the cables and anchors, the fixed and movable rigging. They teamed up to operate the capstan, rotating its drum with levers to load or unload heavy supplies, weapons, and ballast. They even shaved the legs and manicured the toenails of their masters, perhaps setting the stage for sexual relations between the two, even though such behavior was strictly forbidden. Apprentices were the group most likely to be disciplined, to be whipped for disobedience, or to be confined to the stocks for as long as a week. If an apprentice survived all the ordeals and hazards of life at sea, he could apply for certification as a sailor, receiving a document signed by the ship's pilot, bosun, and master. He was now a professional mariner and could look forward to a career lasting about 20 years, if he lived that long. Sailors advanced through the ranks by learning how to handle the helm, deploy the sounding line, splice cables, and, if they were mathematically inclined, marking charts and taking measurements of celestial objects to fix the ship's position. Most sailors were in their teens or twenties. Anyone who had reached his thirties was considered a veteran scalawag. By the time he had survived to that age, he had seen what life at sea held, brutality, loneliness, and disease. He had experienced flashes of camaraderie and heroism, as well as persistent dishonesty and callousness. He knew all about the avarice of ship owners, the uncomprehending indifference of kings under whose flags the expedition sailed, and the tyranny of captains. Men rarely went to sea beyond the age of 40. Magellan, nearly that age when he left Seville, was among the oldest, if not the oldest, person aboard the Armada de Molucca. No matter how high an ordinary sailor rose, he was outranked by specialists such as gunners, essential to expeditions exploring new lands. Skilled in the use of cannon and in the preparation of gunpowder and the selection of projectiles, a gunner tended to his weapons throughout the voyage. Less glamorous but equally necessary fields of specialization included carpenters, caulkers, and coopers, there was also a complement of divers aboard the fleet, whose job it was to swim under the ships and, when necessary, clear seaweed from the rudder and keel, and inspect the hull for signs of exterior damage and leaks. The ship's barber, 
another specialist, was deceptively named because trimming beards was the least of his responsibilities. He served as the onboard dentist, doctor, and surgeon, ministering to the crew out of his chest of nostrums, herbs, and folk remedies. No one answered to the description of cook aboard these ships because the job was considered too demeaning. One sailor telling another that his beard smelled of smoke was tantamount to provoking a fight. The crew took turns cooking or paid the apprentices to cook for them. And during foul weather, there was no cooking at all. And the sailors endured cold repasts of hardtack, salted meat, and wine. Officers ranked just above the sailors and specialists in the fleet's hierarchy. One tier consisted of the steward, charged with keeping an eye on the food supply, the bosun, or contramaestre, the bosun's mate, and the alguacil. The alguacil, for which there is no exact translation, served as the king's representative aboard the ship and military officer. If Magellan needed to arrest a crew member, he ordered the alguacil to perform the deed. This was not a job designed to endear him to the other crew members, and the alguacil stood apart from the rest of the crew. At the top of the pinnacle came the pilot, who plotted the ship's route, the master, who supervised the precious cargo, and finally the captain. Each of the top three officers had his own page, and his captain general, Magellan, had several, including his illegitimate son, and they lived a life as separate as possible from the rank-and-file sailors and apprentices. The officers had their own cabins, cramped, to be sure, but a mark of distinction, and they rarely ate with the crew. To most of the men aboard the fleet, even the flagship Trinidad, Ferdinand Magellan seemed a remote, imperious figure, authoritarian and arbitrary, a man whose every word was law, and on whose skill, luck, and good judgment their lives depended. In the late hours of January 10, 1520, a severe storm descended on the Armada de Molucca, forcing Magellan to seek shelter. He ordered the fleet to reverse course and head toward Paranagua Bay. During the journey to safety, fierce but erratic winds blew the fleet off course, and Magellan found himself in dangerously shallow waters. Before him stretched the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, a funnel-shaped river located on the coast of what is now Argentina. Sailing into these shallow, sediment-rich waters, Magellan thought he might have been entering the waterway leading to Asia, but the weather frustrated his efforts at reconnaissance. The region's climate is typical of the temperate middle latitudes. Dry winds, called zondas, swoop down from the Andes. When they combine with cold offshore currents in the Atlantic, the result can be coastal storms called sudestadas, and it was probably a robust sudestada that caused Magellan to turn back and seek shelter. Magellan faced difficult choices. If he lowered sail and tried to ride out the storm, the winds might blow his helpless fleet onto the shoals, or even ashore, where disaster waited. But if he attempted to enter the harbor under short sail, he might run aground in the shallow water. He chose to proceed north with extreme caution. He made sure to sound the waters and learned to his relief that they were deep enough for his ships to pass unharmed. When the storm finally relented, Magellan turned south again and returned to the Rio de la Plata. Although many on board the fleet argued that the river led to the strait, Magellan remained skeptical. Still, he would have to conduct a careful surveillance just in case. And even if there was no strait, they had at least found abundant provisions. During the next two weeks, the men took on water and caught fish, or rather learned how to catch fish. Magellan's crew displayed considerable courage, even foolhardiness, when they confronted Indians in the region. Magellan dispatched not one but three longboats. The men were armed, which gave them an advantage, but otherwise at the mercy of the indigenous people of the river basin. No sooner had the boats landed than the men jumped into the surf and chased the Indians, observing them. Rather than standing and fighting, the Indians simply outran them. Pigafetta noted, They made such enormous strides that with all our running and jumping, we could not overtake them. That night, 
a large canoe left the shore and approached Trinidad. Standing upright in the middle of the vessel was an Indian covered with animal skins, apparently a chief. As the canoe drew close, the men aboard the flagship noticed that he exhibited no sign of fear. He indicated that he wished to come aboard, and Magellan agreed. When they were face to face, Magellan offered the Indian two gifts, a shirt and a jersey. The captain general then displayed a piece of metal, hoping to learn if the Indian was familiar with it. Recognizing the object, the Indian indicated that his tribe possessed some form of metal. Assuming the Indian would leap at the chance to obtain more, Magellan expected to barter metal objects, such as bells and scissors, for food and scouting assistance, but after the Indian left Trinidad, he never returned. The fleeting encounter with the indifferent tribal leader baffled Magellan and his officers. If they were received well, the sailors were ready for orgies, and the priests for conversions. If they were attacked, they were ready for battle, but they were not prepared to be ignored. During the fleet's layover, Magellan constantly sounded the depths of the Rio de la Plata, hoping that the water would swallow the lead, indicating that he had found the strait, but the stream remained precariously shallow. A channel or a strait would be deeper, he reasoned, and its current would run faster. Unwilling to commit the entire fleet to the river, he dispatched Santiago, the smallest ship, and the one with the shallowest draft, to explore its murky and seductive reaches. Santiago spent two days sailing upstream, constantly sounding the river, trying to avoid running aground. Magellan temporarily abandoned the flagship, Trinidad, to explore the waterway for himself aboard San Diego. At no point was the river deeper than three fathoms, too shallow for the ships to pass safely, and too shallow to suggest that it was a strait running all the way to Asia and the Spice Islands. Despite the many indications that they had found nothing but a large river, the other captains held fast to the belief that the Rio de la Plata would lead them to the Indies, and they urged Magellan not to abandon his reconnaissance. But he had made up his mind to turn back, and once Magellan decided on a course of action, nothing could deter him. By the end of January, Magellan gave up and reversed direction, now facing directly into winds that made his return to the coast slow and erratic. On February 3, 1520, the fleet resumed its southward course in search of the real strait, if it existed. Magellan adopted measures to ensure that he did not sail past the strait for which he was searching. He dropped anchor at night and resumed sailing in the morning as close to shore as he dared, always on the lookout for any formation suggesting a strait. As they ventured toward 40 degrees latitude, passing along the eastern coast of what is now Argentina, the weather steadily turned colder, a warning of the discomfort and hazards that awaited them. Their deliverance from the brisk days and frigid nights at sea would come only in the form of the strait, if such a strait existed, but it proved maddeningly elusive. Without realizing it, they were heading into latitudes notorious for sudden, frequent, violent squalls. And on February 13th, they ran into another storm, tossing the boats, damaging Victoria's keel, and terrifying the sailors with thunder and lightning and torrential downpours. When this storm finally blew itself out, St. Elmo's fire once again appeared on the masts of the flagship, lighting the way, reassuring the sailors that they enjoyed divine protection. The farther south he went, the more concerned Magellan became that he had accidentally passed the strait. On February 23rd, he retraced part of his route, and the following day, the black ships reached the expansive mouth of San Matias Gulf on the coast of Argentina. To Magellan, the gulf appeared far more likely to lead to the strait than the Rio de la Plata because the water was deep and blue and chilly. The men of the fleet might have seen whales because this was the principal breeding site of the southern right whale. If they sailed close to land, they would have spotted penguins, sea lions, and even huge elephant seals lolling on the rocky shores. And if they had gone ashore, they would have encountered an animal paradise of foxes, hares, puma, peregrine falcons, owls, flamingos, hairy armadillos, and parrots. But Magellan preferred to anchor offshore, away from danger, as he continued his single-minded quest for the strait. The fate of the expedition depended on finding it. 
After six months at sea, Magellan's ability to lead the Armada was still in grave doubt. Many of the most influential Castilian officers, and even the Portuguese pilots, were convinced that their fierce and rigid captain general was leading them all to their deaths in his zeal to find the Spice Islands. A crucial evolution of Magellan's style of leadership, and perhaps his character, occurred over a period of nine trying months, from February to October 1520. He emerged from the ordeal a very different man from the one who had begun the voyage. The Magellan of February teetered on the brink of being murdered by the many commanded. The Magellan of October was on the way to earning a place in history. In the intervening months, he passed a series of tests that forced him to confront his own limits as a leader and to change his ways or die. Hugging the coast, the fleet spent the last week of February sailing west toward Bahia Blanca, a spacious harbor worthy of investigation. Magellan led his ships in and around the islands of the bay, but found no sign of his strait. As he familiarized himself with the coastline, he became increasingly confident of his navigational skills, and he resumed sailing 24 hours a day, staying well offshore at night to avoid rocks and reefs lurking below the dark water. Finally, on February 27th, the Armada explored a promising inlet with two islands sheltering what appeared to be numerous ducks. Magellan named the inlet Bahia de los Patos, Duck Bay, and he carefully explored it to locate an entrance to the strait. He cautiously committed only six seamen to a landing party charged with fetching supplies, mainly wood for fire and fresh water. Fearful of stumbling across warlike tribes that might be prowling in the forest, the landing party confined their activities to a diminutive island lacking in either fresh water or wood, but seething with wildlife. On closer inspection, what appeared to be ducks turned out to be something quite different. Pigafetta identified them as geese, but from his description, it is apparent that the geese were actually penguins. These goslings are black and have feathers over their body of the same size and fashion, and they do not fly, and they live on fish. Pigafetta marveled at another beast they encountered, one worthy of Pliny himself, and all the more wonderful because it was absolutely real. He wrote, The sea wolves of these two islands are of various colors and of the size and thickness of a calf. By sea wolves, Pig of Feta meant the sub-Antarctic sea lion or the sea elephant. Although these mammals spend most of their time in the ocean, they occasionally spend relaxing months frolicking on shore in uncannily human family groups, lolling, stretching, yawning, scratching themselves, and peering lazily at their surroundings. The adults weigh a thousand pounds, and if butchered properly, their rich meat and blubber could provide abundant food, and their thick, glossy, silvery-gray pelts a sorely needed source of warmth in these frigid latitudes. A storm blasted the island just as the landing party attempted to return to the waiting fleet. They managed to make it back safely to the ships, but the squall was fierce enough that Trinidad's mooring cables parted, one after the other. Helpless in the storm, pitching wildly, hurling her crew this way and that, the flagship veered dangerously close to the rocks near the shore. Only one cable now held fast, and if it gave, Trinidad and her men, Magellan included, would all be lost. The sailors prayed to the Virgin and to all the saints they knew. Their prayers were answered when not one but three glorious instances of St. Elmo's fire danced on the ship's yardarms, casting an unearthly light of hope and inspiration. Pigafetta recorded, We ran a very great risk of perishing, but the three bodies of St. Anselm, St. Nicholas, and St. Clair appeared to us, and forthwith the storm ceased. The last deity was especially apt, for St. Clair was considered the patron saint of the blind and was often represented holding a lantern. It was even believed that she could clear up fog and rain. To the religious sailors, the sudden manifestation of these signs was clear evidence that God still watched over them and protected them even in the remotest regions of the globe. As proof, the sole cable protecting them from disaster held until dawn when the storm finally relented. Battered by the storm, Magellan sought shelter in a cove, but the weather refused to cooperate. 
the wind completely disappeared, and the Armada de Molucca remained becalmed until midnight, when a third storm descended on them, the most destructive yet. The gale lasted three days and three nights. The fierce wind and seas tore away the masts, castles, and even the poop decks. Through it all, the beleaguered sailors, trapped in disintegrating vessels that threatened to send them to their deaths at any moment, prayed for salvation with a fervor born of desperation. Once again, their prayers were answered. The five ships rode out the great storm. The damage inflicted by the wind and waves, while serious, could be repaired. Incredibly, no lives were lost, despite all the hazards they had encountered on land and on sea. The Captain General gave the order, and the Armada finally set sail on a southerly course into even colder weather and the approaching sub-equatorial winter. The days grew shorter, and each unruly puff of wind darkened the sea and pummeled the sails, threatening to bloom into yet another squall. Finally, Magellan had enough of exploration. He decided to suspend the search for the strait until the following spring. He turned his attention to finding a safe harbor where the fleet could ride out the approaching cold weather. On March 31st, at a latitude of 49 degrees, 20 minutes, he found it. From his vantage point aboard Trinidad, it appeared to be an ideal haven. The harbor was sheltered, and abundant fish punctured the water's surface, as if in welcome. It was named Port St. Julian. The entrance to the port was framed by impressive gray cliffs, rising 100 feet as the harbor quickly contracted into a channel about half a mile in width. Although it offered protection, the narrow inlet experienced tides of over 20 feet and currents of up to six knots. In these conditions, the ships had to anchor themselves carefully and run cables to the shore to secure their positions. Magellan considered Port St. Julian a landmark of sufficient importance that he wanted to determine its longitude. He consulted San Martin, his official astronomer, who took measurements, consulted with the pilots, and concluded that they might have strayed into Portuguese territory as defined by the Treaty of Tordesillas. The idea appalled Magellan, under orders from King Charles to avoid Portuguese waters and, at the same time, to demonstrate that the Spice Islands lay comfortably within the Spanish realm. The matter was potentially so damning to the entire enterprise that the pilots deliberately obscured the location of Port St. Julian on their charts. Anticipating a long, grueling winter, Magellan placed his crew on short rations, even though the ships groaned with the butchered meat of geese and sea wolves and fish abounded in the harbor. After the unbroken succession of life-threatening ordeals they had faced over the previous seven weeks, the seamen expected to be rewarded for their courage and perseverance, not punished. Outraged by the rationing, they turned insubordinate. They did not believe the street existed. They had tried again and again to find it, risking death while coming up against one dead end after another. If they kept going, they argued, they would eventually perish in one of the cataclysmic storms afflicting the region, or simply fall off the edge of the world when the coastline finally ended. Magellan obstinately reminded them that they must obey their royal commission and follow the coastline wherever it led. The king had ordered this voyage, and Magellan would persist until he reached Land's End or found the strait. In the following days, the men continued to bicker, National prejudices suddenly flashed, usually at Magellan himself. Once again, the Castilians argued that Magellan's insistence that he intended to find the strait or die was proof that he intended to subvert the entire expedition and get them all killed in the process. In the midst of this turmoil, the officers and crew observed the holiest day of the year, Easter Sunday, April 1st. At that moment, Magellan had one paramount concern. Who was loyal to him? and who was not. With a sufficient number of loyal crew members, he would be able to withstand this latest and most serious challenge to his authority. Without them, he might be imprisoned, impaled on a halberd, or even hanged from a yardarm by hell-bent mutineers. Magellan openly told his crew that the other captains had resolved to kill him on Easter Day while he attended Mass ashore. Magellan expected to see all four captains at Easter Mass, but only one, Luis de Mendoza of Victoria, arrived. Magellan invited Mendoza to dine at the Captain General's table. 
a gesture that would force him to proclaim his loyalty to Magellan, but Mendoza coolly declined the request. Magellan appeared unfazed by Mendoza's insubordination, but the Captain General now knew that Mendoza was a conspirator. Mendoza returned to Victoria, where he and the other captains resumed plotting against Magellan, sending messages by longboat from one ship to another. Magellan capitalized on a piece of luck. The longboat belonging to Concepcion's captain, Gaspar de Casada, lost its way in the strong current while ferrying conspiratorial messages between the rebel ships and, to the dismay of the men aboard, drifted helplessly toward the flagship and Magellan himself. To their surprise, the crew of Trinidad, at Magellan's direction, rescued them from the runaway longboat. Even more amazing, Magellan welcomed them aboard the flagship and provided them with a lavish meal, which included plenty of wine. At dinner, the band of would-be mutineers drank a great deal and revealed the existence of the plot to Magellan. They confided that if the plot succeeded, he would be captured and killed that very night. Hearing this, Magellan lost all interest in his visitors and busied himself readying the flagship against attack. Once again, he questioned his crew to see who was loyal to him and who was not, and, satisfied, awaited the inevitable assault. Late that night, Concepcion stirred with life. The captain, Quesada, lowered himself into a longboat and quietly made his way to San Antonio. He was joined there in the dark water lapping at the ship's hull by Juan de Cartagena, former captain and frustrated mutineer, Juan Sebastian Elcano, a veteran Basque mariner who served as Concepcion's master, and a corps of thirty armed seamen. Under cover of darkness, they boarded San Antonio and rushed to the captain's cabin, rousting the hapless Mesquita out of his bunk. This had once been Cartagena's ship, and in his mind it still was. Mesquita offered little resistance as the party of mutineers clapped him into irons and placed him under guard. By this time, word of the uprising had spread throughout the ship, and the crew sprang to life. Juan de Eloriaga, the ship's master and a Basque, valiantly tried to dismiss Quesada from San Antonio before any blood was shed, but Quesada refused to stand down. El Oriaga turned to his bosun, Diego Hernandez, to order the crew to restrain Quesada and quash the mutiny. Quesada shouted, We cannot be foiled in our work by this fool! And he ran El Oriaga through with a dagger, again and again, until El Oriaga, bleeding profusely, collapsed. As the two struggled, Quesada's guard took Hernandez hostage, and suddenly the ship was without officers. The bewildered crew, without anyone to give them orders, and fearing for their lives, gave up their arms to the mutineers. One of their number, Antonio de Coca, the fleet's accountant, actually joined the insurgents, who stored the confiscated weapons in his cabin. The first phase of the mutiny had gone off as planned. Within hours, the mutiny spread like a contagion to two other ships, Victoria, whose captain, Luis de Mendoza, had resented Magellan from the day they left San Lucar de Barrameda, and to Concepcion. Only Santiago, under the command of Juan Serrano, a Castilian, remained neutral. Quesada, for the moment, decided to leave Santiago alone. It was a decision that would later haunt the mutineers. The sun rose over Port St. Julian on April 2nd to reveal a scene of deceptive calm. The five ships of the Armada de Malacca rode quietly at anchor. For the moment, the Captain General remained secure in his stronghold, Trinidad. As a test, he dispatched a longboat to San Antonio, where Quesada and Elcano held sway, to bring sailors ashore to fetch fresh water. As Trinidad's longboat approached, the mutineers waved the sailors away and declared that San Antonio was no longer under the command of Mesquita or Magellan, when the longboat brought this disturbing news back to Magellan, he realized he faced a grave problem, but he remained oblivious to the full extent of the mutiny. He believed he had to contend with only one rebellious ship, not three, until he sent the longboat to pull the other ships and determine their loyalty. From his stronghold aboard San Antonio, Quesada replied, For the king and for myself, 
and Victoria and Concepcion followed suit. Quesada audaciously sent a list of demands by longboat to the flagship. Quesada believed, with good reason, that he had Magellan boxed in, and he tried to force the captain general to yield to the mutineers. Magellan sent word that he would be pleased to hear them out, aboard the flagship, of course. The mutineers replied that they would meet him only aboard San Antonio. To their astonishment, Magellan agreed. Having lulled Quesada and his followers into a sense of false security, Magellan quietly went on the offensive. He began his attempt to recover his fleet by claiming the longboat carrying Quesada's communique. With this equipment in hand, he turned his attention to recapturing at least one ship, and then he would go after the others. He decided not to attempt to reclaim San Antonio, where the mutineers were deeply entrenched, but Victoria. To get her back, he resorted to a ruse. He filled the captured longboat with five carefully selected sailors and instructed them to appear sympathetic to the mutineers, at least at a distance. But beneath their loose clothing, they carried weapons, which they intended to use. Their ranks included Gonzalo Gomez de Espinosa, the master-at-arms. Magellan gave the men a letter addressed to Luis Mendoza, Victoria's captain, ordering him to surrender immediately aboard the flagship. If Mendoza resisted, they were to kill him. As soon as the longboat moved out of sight to begin its mission, the captain general sent a second skiff into the water, filled with 15 loyal members of the flagship's crew under the command of Duarte Barbosa, Magellan's brother-in-law. When the first longboat pulled up to Victoria, Mendoza allowed the party to board his ship. Ginez de Mafra, the best eyewitness to the unfolding mutiny, relates, Mendoza, a daring man when it came to evil deeds, but too rash to take advice, told them to come aboard and give him the letter, which he set about reading in a careless manner. According to other witnesses, Mendoza responded to the letter with mockery and laughter. At that, Espinoza, the military officer, grabbed Mendoza by the beard, violently shook his head, and plunged a dagger into his throat as another soldier stabbed him in the head. With Mendoza dead, Magellan now held the advantage. No sooner had the captain breathed his last than the second longboat rode into position beside Victoria, discharging its complement of loyalists who stormed the ship. As Magellan had calculated, his guard met with little or no opposition. Stunned by the death of their captain, the crew meekly submitted to Magellan's men. To signal Magellan's triumph, Barbosa flew the Captain General's colors from Victoria's mast, announcing to Quesada and the other rebels that the mutiny was ending. Magellan placed Trinidad securely between Victoria and Santiago, now loyal to Magellan. Together, the three vessels blockaded the inlet to the port. The two rebel holdouts, positioned deeper in the harbor, could not escape. Quesada refused to give up. Concepcion and San Antonio remained at the other end of the harbor, offering no clue about the mutineers' intentions. Magellan readied his flagship for combat. He doubled the watch and gave an order to make a plentiful provision of much darts, lances, stones, and other weapons, both on deck and in the tops. Magellan entrusted one seaman with a perilous assignment. Under cover of darkness, he was to sneak on board Quesada's ship, Concepcion, where he would loosen or sever the anchor cable. Magellan calculated that the strong nocturnal ebb tide would draw her toward the blockade guarding the mouth of the harbor, giving him just the pretext he needed for launching a surprise attack. Late that night, Concepcion drifted mysteriously across the harbor. Because no one knew of Magellan's subterfuge, she appeared to be dragging her anchor it was only a matter of time before she came within range of the flagship and touched off a battle at sea. Aboard Concepcion, the rebellion was beginning to falter. Ginez de Mafra, held hostage along with Mesquita, noticed that Quesada, the leader of the mutiny, was experiencing pangs of remorse, but he could not persuade his followers to end their rebellion now. Quesada's only hope, a faint one, was to slip past the blockade and escape. De Mafra wrote, he gave the order to weigh anchor, but this did not turn out well for him as the current brought his ship down the river to the flagship. Casada patrolled the quarterdeck, 
bearing sword and shield, hoping to regain control of the ship, or, failing that, to slip past Magellan unnoticed. Instead, he sailed straight into a trap. As Concepcion approached the flagship, Magellan shouted, Treason! Treason! and ordered his men to ready their weapons. Suddenly, Trinidad opened fire on the approaching vessel, hurling cannonballs onto her decks. Before Quesada's men could offer resistance, Trinidad's loyal seamen grappled Concepcion to her side and rushed aboard as Victoria performed the same maneuver on the hapless ship's starboard side. Who are you for? the attackers cried as they swarmed across Concepcion's cramped decks. For the king, came the response, and Magellan. The mutineers about face may have saved their lives because Magellan's guard made straight for Casada and his inner circle, who offered little resistance. The guard freed Mesquita, the deposed captain, along with Jean Estemafra. The coup was generally bloodless. With Casada and his inner circle under arrest, and Concepcion returned to Magellan's control, the mutiny of Port St. Julian came to an ignominious conclusion. Even Juan de Cartagena, aboard San Antonio, gave up hope of carrying out a mutiny. When Magellan demanded Cartagena's immediate surrender, the rebellious Castilian meekly complied and was confined in irons in Trinidad's hold. Now that the Easter mutiny was finally at an end, Magellan meted out punishment to the guilty parties. The mutineers were about to discover that defying Magellan was even more perilous than the most ferocious storm at sea. To begin, Magellan instructed one of his men to read an indictment of Mendoza as a traitor. The captain general then ordered his men to draw and quarter Mendoza's body. Magellan directed that the quartered remains be spitted and displayed as a warning of exactly how traitors would be treated. The preserved body parts of Luis de Mendoza remained visible throughout the next several months in Port St. Julian, an indelible lesson to the men concerning the consequences of mutiny. Magellan's display of barbarism did not end there. He was only beginning to exact revenge for the mutineer's insult to his authority and to the honor of King Charles. More than execution, torture was his ultimate weapon at sea. That he resorted to torture was not unusual. This was, after all, the era of the Spanish Inquisition. To punish the other offenders, Magellan conducted a secular inquisition at Port St. Julian. He appointed his cousin, Alvaro de Mesquita, as judge, presiding over an exhaustive trial. First, Magellan had promoted him to captain of San Antonio over the heads of more qualified pilots and master seamen, both Spanish and Portuguese. Now, Mesquita functioned as Magellan's agent of agony, deciding who was guilty of treason and who would suffer the consequences. No wonder the men hated him. Mesquita spent two weeks assessing the evidence of guilt. He let one of the accused off with a slap on the wrist. The accountant, Antonio de Coca, was merely deprived of his rank. But Mesquita found Andres de San Martin, the esteemed astronomer-astrologer, Hernando Morales, a pilot, and a priest, all guilty of treasonous behavior. Mesquita ordered San Martin to undergo the most common punishment of the Inquisition, the ghastly strapado. The strapado was administered in five stages of increasing agony. In the first degree, the victim was stripped. His wrists were bound behind his back, and he was threatened until he confessed. If he refused, he was subjected to the second degree. In it, The victim's arms were raised behind his back by a rope attached to a pulley secured overhead, and he was lifted off his feet for a brief period of time and given another chance to confess. If he still refused, he faced the third degree of the strapado, in which he was suspended for a longer period of time, which dislocated his shoulders and broke his arms. If he still failed to confess, he was subjected to the fourth degree, The victim was suspended and violently jerked, which inflicted excruciating pain. In certain cases, there was a fifth degree as well. In the final phase of the strapado, weights were attached to the victim's feet, and they were often heavy enough to tear the limbs from his tormented body. Andres de San Martin suffered the full five stages of the strapado. 
In the last, most horrific stage of Magellan's Inquisition, several cannonballs were attached to San Martin's feet, and the additional weight inflicted awful pain when he was suspended. San Martin survived the ordeal. In fact, he recovered sufficiently to return to his former position as an astronomer and astrologer. But from then on, he remained wary of Magellan and the entire enterprise of the Armada. The punishment Mesquita and Magellan inflicted on Hernando Morales was even more severe than San Martin's. Accounts of the proceedings say only that Morales's limbs were disjointed. But the procedure to which he was subjected was so severe that the poor pilot later died from the wounds he received. The agonies he suffered at the hands of Mesquita and Magellan can only be imagined. Once the horror of this inquisitional catharsis subsided, Mesquita, with Magellan's blessing, sentenced the other accused in all 40 men to death. A mass execution appeared to be in the making, but the expedition could not continue without the help of the convicted men. Believing that he had finally demonstrated his absolute authority, Magellan commuted all 40 of the death sentences to hard labor. There were two important exceptions to the general clemency. Gaspar de Casada, the leader and murderer of San Antonio's master, and his servant, Luis de Molino. Magellan insisted that Casada be executed, and he gave Molino a brutally simple choice. He could either be executed along with his master or spare his own life by beheading his master. Molina accepted the deal as cruel as it was. In full view of the crew, Casada knelt on the deck of Trinidad and Molino stood over him, sword in hand. He asked his master for forgiveness, but received none. And then with one powerful blow, he severed Casada's head from his neck. Days later, Magellan discovered that Cartagena, the sole surviving Spanish captain, was conspiring with a priest, Pedro Sanchez de la Reina, to mount yet another mutiny. It was astonishing that Magellan's nemesis would risk his life again after all the carnage, this time with little hope that any of the seamen would follow, but Cartagena was almost as stubborn as Magellan. The captain general subjected the two conspirators to a fresh court-martial, his first instinct was to have both men executed. This was, after all, Cartagena's third attempt at mutiny. But Magellan found himself in a difficult position. He could not bring himself to condemn a priest, even a disloyal priest, to death. And as for Cartagena, his blood ties to Archbishop Fonseca prevented Magellan from taking severe disciplinary action, such as execution or torture. Instead, Magellan devised a much worse fate for Cartagena and the priest. He decided to leave them behind to fend for themselves in the wilderness of Port St. Julian after the fleet's departure. Always a perfectionist about outfitting his ships, Magellan turned his attention to his neglected fleet. The ships were in a state of disrepair, their sails and rigging in disarray, their holds fetid, their hulls leaky. He ordered his men to empty the ships and give them a thorough cleaning. This exhausting chore meant removing all the provisions, even the stone ballast, which was cleansed by seawater. Once they had emptied the ships, the seamen scoured the holds, washed down the wooden surfaces with vinegar to eradicate the ubiquitous stench, and returned the ballast to the ships. So the wretched winter passed, day by day, hour by hour, the men working constantly and trying to keep themselves warm as best they could, enduring life in a prison so remote it needed no walls. Overseeing these projects, Magellan intended to keep his prisoners in chains until they left Port St. Julian in the spring. When the time came to load the provisions, they discovered more evidence that the dishonest Chandlers in Seville and the Canary Islands had robbed them blind and endangered their lives. Although their bills of lading showed enough supplies on board to last a year and a half, long enough to reach the Spice Islands, the ship's holds actually carried only a third of that amount. Magellan realized that they would likely run out of food well before they reached their goal. To make up the difference, the men resumed hunting, but they were eating their way through their supplies almost as fast as they replenished them. The only way out of their predicament was to resume the voyage as soon as possible, storms or no storms. 
finding the strait leading to the Spice Islands, always a priority for Magellan, reached the level of an obsession in late April. When the oppressive weather briefly lifted, he rashly sent out a reconnaissance mission to search for the elusive waterway. He selected Santiago, the soundest of the vessels, for the task, with Juan Serrano as her Castilian captain. Favored by calm weather, the mission began auspiciously enough. On May 3rd, about 60 miles south of Port St. Julian, Serrano discovered a promising inlet, which on closer inspection revealed itself as the mouth of a river, which he named Santa Cruz. Santiago's crew soon discovered that food was even more plentiful around the Santa Cruz River than at Port St. Julian. After the tranquil respite, Santiago set sail and proceeded south again in search of the strait. On May 22nd, the wind picked up and the seas began to churn, tossing the ship. The Armada had encountered many violent squalls, but little Santiago had stumbled into the most powerful storm her crew had ever experienced, and they would have to face it alone. Serrano had no time to reef the sails. Fierce seas pounded the ship mercilessly, terrifying her crew. Overpowering gusts tore the sails, and the seas battered the rudder until the device failed to respond. Santiago was now out of control. The winds pushed the helpless ship toward the rocky coast and the prospect of certain death for her crew. Serrano faced every captain's nightmare as razor-sharp rocks sawed into her hull and she began taking on water. Luck was with her crew since Santiago washed ashore before breaking up. Her crew of 37 jumped to a rocky beach. Santiago sank and the storm carried away all her life-sustaining provisions. Incredibly, all the men aboard ship survived, but the storm had stranded the castaways about 70 miles from the rest of the fleet, without food or wood or fresh water in freezing weather. They were cold and exhausted. Soon they would be starving. There was no way to get word of their plight to the Captain General. Their land route back to Port St. Julian presented seemingly overwhelming obstacles, snow-covered mountains, and the Santa Cruz River, three miles wide. The castaways spent eight days subsisting on a diet of local vegetation and whatever shellfish they could catch, evolving a plan. They would drag the planks over the mountains until they reached the river and there build a raft to cross it. The task proved daunting to the crew. They left most of the planks behind, and after four wretched days, the exhausted crew finally reached the river. The weather had relented and fish were plentiful. It seemed they would not starve after all. Lacking planks to build a raft large enough to carry all the men, the castaways split into two groups. The larger group, 35 men, set up camp at the river's edge, while the smaller, just two men, set out on the tiny raft. They intended to cross the river and walk the rest of the way back to Port St. Julian to seek help. The two crew members in the vanguard succeeded in mastering the river's breadth in their rudimentary raft, and once they had landed on the far side, they set out in the direction of Port St. Julian. At first, they followed the coast, but vast swamps barred their progress, and they had to walk inland over hills and mountains, eating only ferns and roots, and suffering greatly in the freezing weather. The trek lasted eleven harrowing days, and when they reached Port St. Julian, ravaged and gaunt from their ordeal, even those who knew the survivors barely recognized them. Magellan had no choice but to attempt to rescue the other 35 crew members of Santiago. Afraid to risk the loss of another ship, he sent a rescue squad of 24 men, carrying wine and hardtack, along the overland trail that the two survivors had blazed through the harsh wilderness. In four days, they reached the desperate castaways. Relying on the small raft, the rescue party ferried the survivors back across the river in groups of two or three. Each trip consumed hours and was fraught with hazard, but miraculously everyone made it to the northern shore. The 35 castaways and 24 rescuers picked their way through the snows of the Patagonian winter. About a week later, they emerged one by one from the forest surrounding Port St. Julian. As serious as the loss of Santiago might be, Magellan had more to fear from the emotional consequences of the wreck.
The disaster confirmed his crew's fear that the Captain General was leading them on an expedition so dangerous that they would all get killed long before reaching the Spice Islands. To ensure his control of the remaining four ships in the fleet, he saw to it that only die-hard loyalists commanded them. While Mesquita, his first cousin, remained in command of San Antonio, Magellan appointed Barbosa, his brother-in-law, as captain of Victoria, and Serrano, the unlucky skipper of Santiago, as the new captain of Concepcion. Magellan himself still ruled overall from Trinidad. Magellan's appointment of his relatives as captains served to fuel the silent resentment of many crew members, even those from Portugal. 